Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we're just letting everyone fill up. We have a large group tonight, so it's fantastic that we have such interest in this evening's event. Um, just allow us a couple of minutes to fill the room. Uh, for those that don't know, my name is Jeff Robertson. I'm the Executive Director for the PKD Foundation of Canada. Um, thankful and grateful to be here with you all tonight and to be joined by such a marvelous panel uh, from the Transplant Ambassadors Program this evening. Uh, so as you know, tonight's topic is, of course, getting to know the Transplant Ambassador Program. Um, the PKD Foundation of Canada is thrilled to announce our formal partnership with TAP. Um, and the services that you hear uh, this evening and learn more about um, are going to be provided for PKD patients on a national level. So this is something that is absolutely fantastic uh, to be a partner with uh, those at TAP. Um, TAP provides programming for kidney patients and living donors uh, to get together to discuss the barriers to kidney transplantation and what could be done to overcome them. Uh, transplant ambassadors who we'll hear from this evening are kidney transplant recipients or living kidney donors who welcome the opportunity to share their personal experiences with you to help guide you through your kidney journey as well. Uh, as I mentioned, the PKD FOC and TAP are pleased to partner together uh, to enhance and expand kidney patient support programs nationwide. Uh, this evening, I have the privilege to be joined by Susan McKenzie, who is the co-founder and chair of Transplant Ambassador Program, as well as PKD patients and TAP ambassadors, Claudia Morgan and Paul Tealis, uh, who will be sharing their transplant journeys and TAP ambassador experiences with us tonight. Uh, before we dive too deep uh, and we get into Susan's presentation on TAP, I would like to introduce Mary B, who has joined us this evening to provide us with a land acknowledgement. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Jeff. And in Kenawea, Mary Bokash Nishtakas, Nishnabai Kwayandau, Wabishaji Dodem, Nipsing First Nation Demandaguas, Robinson Huron Treaty Dunjaba. I'm Anishinaabe, and in my language, I shared a protocol greeting, which states who I am and where I come from. I'm Martin Clan, and my heart belongs to Nipissing First Nation and Robinson Huron Treaty Territory in Northeastern Ontario. I want to share my appreciation and respect to the elders and teachers in my community, past, present, and emerging. I was a guest in Newfoundland last week, which is the ancestral homelands of the Beothuk, whose culture has now been erased forever. My friend Libby was my tour guide and she shared stories of the area and experiences that she had living there. And as she did this, she remarked that she hadn't taken the time to look at St. John's like a guest would. And she appreciated the opportunity to show me special places in her city. So I ask that you take a moment this long weekend and ground yourself where you are situated. No matter where we are on Turtle Island, we are all guests on the land. Let's remember this as we learn about our own relationship with the land and water and acknowledge what that connection really means and appreciate where we are as if we are looking through someone else's eyes. Enjoy the stories you hear this evening. We are nothing if not for our stories. Miigwech. Thank you. Merci. Oh, thank you, Mary. That is so much appreciated. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce myself as I share my screen to get my presentation. And I do want to acknowledge um, as well that Mary, um, oh, just a minute. I cannot share the screen at the moment. Um, maybe Jeff can. I'm on it right now. Okay. Um, uh, and Mary has been with us as a transplant ambassador from the beginning um, when we started to conceive of this uh, program. Um, as has Claudia from almost the beginning and, and Paul has joined us a little bit more recently, but they'll tell you a little bit more about that when, um, when we get to them. So I think I can share my screen now and um, let me know if you can see no, that. Can, yeah, thanks, Susan. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, view of Mary's, uh, uh, Mary's uh, uh, the location, which uh, uh, gives you a sense of, uh, you know, why she's so, um, honored to be in that location. So I'm Susan McKenzie and I am the, um, I am the co-founder and the um, provincial chair of the Transplant Ambassador Program. 
and uh, we're so excited to um, to be able to do this joint um, webinar tonight. Just to give you a little background um, on TAP for the next five or six minutes, I do want to give most of the time to our speakers tonight, um, Claudia and Paul. But to just give you a little sense, um, uh, you know, we if you check out our um, our website at transplantambassadors.ca, you'll see um, our um, ambassador directory, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and you can look up Paul and um, and Claudia, and you can see some wonderful videos that are posted there uh, and reach out to them directly uh, from there as well. So I'll let them introduce themselves shortly. Our mantra um, as part of, um, you know, in TAP is pretty simple. Um, and we saw this, uh, you know, meme and we, and we kind of adopted it as our own. Uh, one day you'll tell your story of how you've overcome what you're going through now and it will become part of someone else's survival guide. And it was just so perfect uh, in terms of really the passion and um and the energy that our 150 ambassadors bring to this work um it, you know every day in what they do in terms of reaching out um, sharing their lived experience and and providing um information but a lot of support uh, a lot of emotional support and and reassurance as well um so our, our, our program is um everyone in our program are uh, all 150 of us are either um, live, uh, uh, transplant recipients who are living with a successful transplant either uh, from a living donor or from a deceased donor, or uh, the other half of us, the other 50% of us are um, living kidney donors um, who uh, also wanna share their stories. And we share, um, we, we share our stories um, with, um, with people from you know, the beginning of their journey you know, all the way through to the end. And, um, and work with the uh, renal centers, which I'll talk just briefly about in a minute. Once, once uh, COVID hit in March of 2020, we, um, we went virtual, but it, um, you know, it was, a, it was a curse and a blessing in the sense that um, we were able to really, um, uh, you know, build on our assets, including our website and, um, and some of our other features that I'll describe tonight. And um, we're looking back to getting into clinic. We've already started uh, to get back at the clinic a little bit, um, but we do know that virtual, virtual TAP is here to stay. And the conversations um, that we have over the phone and through our, um, our Zoom healthcare, which is a encrypted version of Zoom, uh, you know, the average phone call is 45 you know, minutes. So they tend to be very, um, you, know, uh, you know, really good, really rich conversations. So, you know, there are a number of support programs out there. Uh, we built the TAP program as a research initiative. So it has a number of, um, a number of differences uh, with it. All of us uh, have uh, done vulnerable sector police checks. We have all of those on file for any, any of our ambassadors. They're fully trained by both TAP and by the, at least one renal hospital in Ontario where they can um, go in and, um, visit clinics in person. Um, we do follow um, some fairly strict privacy and confidentiality protocols around our uh, metrics. We do keep metrics. Um, we, we want to measure our impact and we wanna know if what we're doing is making a difference and is it increasing transplant rates? Um, but we do that without any um, identifying information. So we do not track any patient um, information at all uh, on any of our, um, with any of our metrics. We do really pride ourselves in connecting um, patients and their family members with people from across the province with whom they can relate on a number of um, on a number of uh, factors, and I'll get to that in just one second. Our ambassadors all have their own uh, transplant ambassador email that they do their uh, tap work from. That's again a secure email um, that so you always know if you're talking to an ambassador um, or not. We are very, very, very proud to be independent and patient led. Uh, driven, uh, you know, completely on the patient, on the on the passion and energy of patients and living donors, and we really work hard to build ongoing relationships with the people that we talk to, and we've seen that um, many, many times, and we've also seen many people that we've spoken to over the last uh, five years um, of our program who have who have come to us to be transplant ambassadors themselves because of the impact um, it had to be able to talk to someone at a critical time in their life. Um, this slide looks complicated because it's from the ORN, <laughs> but it really just means that we are, um, 
we are a, 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 a pillar within the access to kidney transplant strategy, the AKT strategy, um, which, um, which gives us the privilege of working um, with the hospitals in the circle of care um, to help, um, uh, you know, to help uh, both patients and their, their families and donors. The goal of the overall um, program in Ontario is to increase living kidney donor transplants um, to 300 uh, by the year 2025. And I believe it was um, just over 200, 240 something last year, which actually seems like a really low number, but um, we're gonna do our best to increase that. So our diversity um, across, the, across our 150 ambassadors is quite extensive, both by gender, age, hospitals that they've had experiences in, their kidney experience in terms of, you know, were they a preemptive um, transplant? Were they on hemodialysis, um, key, uh, you know, uh, PD? Were they, um, you know, were they in the paired donor exchange? All kinds of different factors that we connect people on and that people want to talk to someone who's had that experience. Obviously, um, cultural background and, and language. So we do have um, 20 different languages represented in the program, uh, which we're, we're really happy about, but there are many more languages than 20 and, um, and we're always actively recruiting so that we can even serve a more diverse population. Um, on our, uh, on our um, website, which I would go into, but I'm afraid my, my uh, bandwidth would fail me, uh, but if you go to transplantambassadors.ca in the top right hand corner is a um, is an ambassador directory where you can use any of these legends uh, in the tiles and colored tiles or a combination of them. So if you want to find a kidney transplant recipient who had a preemptive transplant, it will bring those up for you and you can uh, read a bit more about their story uh, and you can uh, reach out to them directly. Oftentimes there's a video about them. So what we love about this is it puts patients in the driver's seat in terms of who they want to talk to. We can take a pretty good guess, or sometimes they will ask to speak to someone of a particular, um, you know, with a particular profile, but um, the best is if they can identify the person they, can, they think they can relate to the best. So that's what we make uh, possible for them. I wanted to spend just a little bit of time before I pass it over to Claudia uh, to talk about this new service that we have been, uh, we launched about two months ago. It's a service that's already become quite popular. Uh, called Patients Seeking Donors. It is just um, kind of a different uh, feature on our website where we're, we're currently profiling um, about 39 um, peop, uh, patients from across Canada who, are, who are, have, are in the position of looking for a living uh, kidney donor. They've been asked by their doctor to find a kidney donor and they are really struggling with that, um, uh, to do that. So um, this new site um, gives them an opportunity to post a little bit of information about themselves, again, on a secure website. We've had a little bit of, um, uh, of uh, press about that. And there's some media links here if you're interested in finding out a bit more. Um, when you go into any of these, um, any of these people's profiles, uh, so this just happens to be uh, Samantha's, I brought her up because um, they're very easy to do. We can create them in like five minutes. Uh, we always ask the, uh, um, the the patient to approve them and they can fill them out online and then they approve them before they go live. But the key, two key things I just wanted to point out here is that we can provide them with a, um, with a transplant ambassador email so they don't have to put their own information online. And we also provide them with a personal URL that they can, um, that they can send out to their uh, family and friends and other networks. And we've already seen some patients that have had um, some great success uh, just in terms of getting that URL out to people that they already know that didn't know their, their situation. So, so far it's been working out um, really well. This is my last slide, which is really just about um, um, uh, saying thank you to, um, you know, to our, um, to our friends at the PKD Foundation for um, joining with us to make this service available to all of the patients and family members that they speak with. Our next two webinars um, coming up are about, uh, uh, we'll be sharing the stories of uh, kidney transplant um, recipients and living donors over the age of 60, of which we have many in our program, um, and uh, try to do a bit of myth busting there about who can donate and who can receive. And then we'll talk in November again about um, the big tell, which is really about how to tell your story, how to share your story. And we're excited to be work working on a co-documentary, a, a co-production with Rogers TV that will um, talk about living donation um, and will be out across Ontario in the fall. So with that, um, I, and join us 
obviously join us on social media, hear about uh, all the cool stuff that we're doing, but I want to pass it over now. I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to, um, to, to Claudia to share a little bit about her story and also her experience as a transplant ambassador. Over to you, Claudia. Thank you, Sue. So good evening, everyone. My name is Claudia Morgan and I am a transplant ambassador with Sunnybrook Hospital. I am 45 years old and I'm a PKD survivor. My journey started from a relatively early age um, when I was first diagnosed. I inherited PKD from my father who wasn't diagnosed with PKD until he was in his thirties after suffering many years of chronic uncontrolled high blood pressure. Um, I really didn't start to see a decline in my health until I was probably in my twenties. Um, when I when my GP referred me to a nephrologist and that nephrologist monitored me for approximately 15 years. Um, when I was seeing my nephrologist, I noticed certain changes in my health. I noticed that my creatinine levels started to increase. I noticed that I, my blood pressure started to become uncontrollable. Um, I was having urinary tract infections, uh, kidney infections. Um, and that was just what was going on in the interior. On the exterior, I noticed that uh, my the kidneys started to become so large that my abdomen started to become distended. And at one point I looked like I was pregnant and that was probably the toughest part of my journey, which was every time that I would leave my home, um, I had to deal with people either asking me, um, you know, uh, basically calling me fat or um, asking me how far along I was in my pregnancy, or some may have been even bold enough to come and rub my belly um, during my journey. And so that was very, very tough for me. Um, and it got to the point where um, I just started to go along with the, the story and I would actually lie and say, you know what? Oh, I'm six months along, I'm seven months along. Because at that point I felt it was just easier to use that explanation than to have to actually explain what was going on at that particular time. Uh, you know, it's, it's very challenging when you're trying to explain to somebody what you're physically going through when they don't necessarily know what it is or understand what PKD is. So from that standpoint, uh, I, 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 it really did bother me. The other thing is I had to make a decision relatively early on, um, knowing my condition, whether or not I wanted to have children, um, could I have children? And if I did have children, what was the likelihood that my children might inherit PKD? Um, and, did I, and did I want to potentially subject my future children to what I was going through at that particular moment? So that is one of the decisions that I had to make. Um, by the age of 25, uh, my nephrologist had warned me that my health was going to slowly decline. And as it deteriorated, I was able to sort of manage through until I got into my uh, late thirties. And at that point, my nephrologist sat down with me and told me that they were giving me probably six months to a year before I would require dialysis. And at that point, um, I sat down with my family and I had a conversation about what I wanted to do before I ended up on dialysis. And at that time, I determined that I wanted to take one last vacation uh, before I, it would be, travel would be too difficult for me. So I sat down with the nephrology team and I discussed what my plans were. They gave me the go ahead to go ahead and do that. And at that point, I decided that I was going to go to Paris, France to take my last vacation. Before I left, I did my usual blood and urine workup and I took off. And I enjoyed one full lovely week while in Paris. And during that trip, I would say that I, felt relatively okay. I was slightly tired, but that didn't seem a normal for me because 
during my whole 15 years being monitored, uh, chronic fatigue was just a normal part of, of everyday life. When I returned from my trip, um, I turned on my phone only to see that I had missed 13 calls from the, uh, from my, the nephrologist and the, the clinic asking me to call them back immediately. When I did call them back, I just, they informed me that my blood work had shown that my, basically that my kidney function had dropped to an all time low and that I needed to start dialysis right away. So immediately I started the process of getting worked up to do, uh, do dialysis. Um, my fistula surgery was booked and uh, in the meantime, I was hooked up with a catheter and I started my dialysis. During that time, I ran into multiple hurdles. Uh, my first fistula surgery didn't work. My veins were too small. Um, so that wasn't, that didn't work. Then they decided to try doing a fistula on, the, on my uh, other arm, similar problem where my veins were too small. I wasn't able to develop a fistula. So finally, what they ended up deciding is that they would, I would use a uh, catheter and I would do dialysis through my catheter. I ran into multiple problems during my time in dialysis. Uh, the first five months, um, I think I must have had probably maybe two or three line changes and dialysis just wasn't working for me. Uh, it was sort of like a short term solution, but it was the only solution that was available at the time. At that point, my nephrologist came to me and sat down and had a conversation saying to me, listen, you're relatively young. Have you given any thought to potentially doing a kidney transplant? And at that time, it didn't even occur to me because uh, during that time, uh, no one in my family who had, who had uh, PKD had ever had a transplant. My grandmother passed away at the age of 61. My father subsequently passed away at the age of 47 due to complications with his kidney and also high blood pressure. His brother passed away at the, in the ages of 40. And most of my relatives had not past the age of 60 or 61. So I didn't know anything about transplantation or even if that was a possibility for me. My nephrologist encouraged me to look into it and to look into possibly getting a live donor. And so I sat down with my mom and I had a conversation with her about what my nephrologist had discussed. And instantly, my mother stepped forward and offered to be a potential donor. And so when she did that, we started the process of getting her tested. And through her testing, we discovered that my mother had diabetes and she wasn't aware of that. So that instantly took her out of uh, being a possible candidate for myself um, as a donor. I didn't have any other options at that time. Um, I couldn't think of anybody else that I could even potentially ask or wanted to ask. And so I basically came to the resolve that I would uh, either wait for a deceased donor or I would just ride my time out um, on dialysis. And it was during that time of frustration that I went to my church and I was speaking with my pastor just about the frustrations I was going through, the uh, the difficulties I had some days when my lines didn't, my line didn't work and just the overall pain and frustration that I was feeling in not having a solution on, on how to improve my life. And it was during that conversation that my minister posed the question um, about potentially, what did I think about potentially creating a social media video? And I wasn't sure if that was something that I was comfortable with simply because I'm a very private person and not a lot of my friends and family knew what I was going through and that I had even begun dialysis. So I wasn't sure if that was something that I necessarily wanted to share with the world. 
So we came up with a happy medium, which is let me create a video that was explaining my journey, but we would start off by only sharing it with the immediate congregation and nobody else. So my pastor uh, came along, created this video um, showcasing sort of what I'm going through, my journey. And when he was complete, we decided to show it to the congregation. And that day was probably one of the most nerve wracking days of my life because here I am letting these people who are close to me know some of the most personal things that I'm going through, um, my story, and I'm being my most vulnerable. And I was really surprised at the reception that I got from my video. So many people came to me and thanked me for sharing my story. They had no idea uh, what I was going through and they found it very informative. So after we did that, my pastor came back to me again and said to me, okay, now that we've done the congregation, how do you feel about posting your video on Facebook? And again, there was some hesitation on my part. Uh, I wasn't sure if that was something that I was ready to do. Uh, Cause it's one thing to share with the congregation, which is, you know, maybe a hundred people at most but it's another thing to share your story with the entire world. So I really sat on that. And after a little bit of time, I decided, you know what, Claude, what do you really have to lose? You've come this far, let's just share the story. So I decided, okay, let's do this. And we decided to post the video on my Facebook and that video went viral. And I, I looked and every couple of hours, I would see that my video was being, was being liked, it was being shared and it was being reposted. And somehow or another, my video ended up going all the way to Okinawa, Japan, where it landed in the hands of a missionary that was stationed there. And that missionary was so touched by my video that she decided to reshare my video with her sister who is a nurse stationed in Toronto, Ontario. And her sister, after seeing the video, decided to step forward and uh, be tested, and she ended up becoming my donor. So in May of 2018, uh, my, that lovely nurse gave me the gift of life, and, uh, and I've never looked back since. And um, I, I, I truly don't have words to thank her for her generosity, because this is a person who didn't know me at all, but felt so touched that she decided to, to do this for me. So the question becomes now is, why did I decide to join the Transplant Ambassador Program? And so quite simply put, the reason why I joined the, the Joint Tap is because I wanted to change the narrative. There's, I like the concept of taking patient uh, recipients and donors and connecting them with people who are going through their new, the start of their journey and having them sort of guide and navigate those people um, through some of the difficult questions and concerns that they have. There are some things that you may want to ask but are too embarrassed to ask of your doctor or of family and friends that a TAP ambassador is able to answer for you or at least guide you through. And I like that. I like that one-on-one. -on -one. And then also too, I realized that if I wanted to see change, I had to be the change. And that's really why I joined TAP. So um, Paul, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, Claudia. Um... Well, I've not heard your story, so we we have so much crossover uh, in different ways. It's it's really amazing. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, I want to encourage you to ask questions um, at the end or through email because I'm a bit of an open book about polycystic kidney and my transplant experience. Um, I had a mother who I had a mother who was diagnosed very late in life, 55 years old, 
and she had polycystic kidney and ended up going on home dialysis. This would have been in the mid 80s. So I grew up as a teenager with a parent on dialysis, but not fully understanding what was going on. She lasted only five years and uh, unfortunately had a stroke um, and she passed away. And I ended up getting tested a few years on and I was diagnosed with polycystic kidney and it had already had advanced, which means I likely was born with it or it had always been present and was continuing to grow. Now, this was in this was in early, early 90s, about 93, 94. Um, I ended up going to my mother's uh, nephrologist at the time, and he said, there's very little known about polycystic kidney, but we had already maintained in the family, no salt, cut out red meats, we were eating very well and eating very healthy, lots of water. So all the stuff you can just do to maintain a, a healthy lifestyle. So I essentially continued that. And the one thing I did is I knew I didn't want to go the route um, of my mother, but there's not much I could do. So one of the, um, I chose in my life up until even today, I said, I'm going to start chasing what I want to do. I, uh, started traveling. I've worked in 35 countries as a photographer. I've worked in both polar regions. I got to Hollywood to work. I really chased everything and just sort of followed my own path. I came back to Toronto in 2002, I was 38. Um, I got a new doctor and I also got a new nephrologist. And this began the, the PKD story in the sense that you're now progressing we have to follow you every year ultrasounds my blood pressure was good i was only on one medication at the time um and i was i managed to continue traveling up until 2017 when my last trip working in antarctica and there was a significant change between 2015 and 2017 very similar to claudia i was starting to get a beer belly as my cysts were growing. Um, I was also starting to have cyst bleeds. My creatinine was going through the roof and I was uh, just experiencing a lot of fatigue. It was getting very hard to work overseas. Uh, and also I, I maintained a job in Toronto as well at a studio. So it was getting very difficult. Uh, people were starting to notice that I was changing in various ways, uh, especially the fatigue and tired and not having all the energy. And this sort of became, became the impetus to tell people, well, I'm suffering from polycystic kidney. It's hereditary. It's fairly rare. They don't know much about it. And eventually um, my kidneys are going to fail. Um, people started on their own, just coming forward and said, when you need somebody to test, let me know what I need to do and I'll test to see if I'm compatible for um, a kidney, uh, to be a kidney donor. At one point I had 12 donors, 12 living donors, all friends. Many got rejected prior to even filling out paperwork uh, at Toronto General. Uh, preconditions, their doctor said, you, you just, you can't qualify. I had a few people with AB positive and AB negative, which is the rarest blood type. And that would have been really difficult for a paired exchange. Although I told, I was told not impossible, but it would just be a different process. So my last trip in 2017, I, bas I basically was done. Um, and in early 2018, through testing, I had hit basically around 10% kidney function. And at that point, they started at Sunnybrook, my eligibility to see if I could actually uh, withstand a transplant. So um, <clears throat> the process itself, I think I started in April. I was done by the end of the summer. There was a lot of back and forth on stuff and extra tests needed based on my mother's history. But what I had already started at that time, I had three donors who, had, who were ready to go. 
and and one was a blood match one was one was o positive because i'm b positive and so she was a blood match one was a positive which would have meant an exchange and one was ab negative which means she probably wouldn't wouldn't be tested which was the case so i had everybody fill their paperwork out while i was testing so they were ready while i was uh going through my testing and i was deteriorating pretty fast so my first donor was rejected on medical grounds and i immediately had to go on dialysis which was not my plan uh so i chose to do uh a hemodialysis so i had a uh, i had a catheter in my chest and i chose to go in to sunnybrook to their cnib clinic uh three times a week uh it felt like a part-time job um, I'm writing a book. So I wrote and I read and I used that time efficiently as well as getting to know other people, um, with, with, uh, who, and what they were experiencing, um, with kidneys, uh, kidney disease and, and dialysis as my first donor was rejected. My second donor started. So time was just continuing to move and eventually she was rejected. And in that time frame, when people, you know, I'm at work, people are finding out I'm leaving early, I've got to go to have, you know, I go, have to go do dialysis. Other people were starting to step forward. So as one got rejected, another person stepped forward. So after my second donor, a third, my friend in Texas decided to do a Twitter campaign. I got a fourth out of that, also rejected. Um, as I was managing my dialysis, I was having a lot of complications with my overgrown, my, both my kidneys were around, one was around 10 pounds and one was around seven. And my seven pound kidney, which is my left kidney is still inside. I still have it, but my, uh, I was starting to have a lot of cyst bleeds and they were getting really scary. And I had a really bad one that just never stopped. So I literally was in, um, emergency um and we were going to remove it anyway because we needed room for the new for a potentially a new kidney and um it got removed my transplant um sorry my dialysis nephrologist said it was the largest he'd ever seen it was just over 10 pounds once it was out most of my complications disappeared my blood pressure went back to normal uh, my eating problems not maintaining, um, couldn't maintain a full stomach because everything was being pushed up, went away. I could exercise a bit more, but I'm still on, you know, I'm still on dialysis. So my fifth donor, fifth living donor, a friend of mine from my industry, who I'd only known as a friend uh, and somebody I'd worked with, stepped forward and said, I'll test. And um, for him, it got him to lose a bit of weight. Uh, got him to exercise more so he actually got a lot out of it but he also in the end got rejected but he went the furthest he went to the paired exchange program before he couldn't go any further um and then a very interesting um incident happened i learned from my brother that uh there was a death in the family of a good friend of my oldest friend from kindergarten who I had I still talk to she had moved from Ottawa to um Damascus Ontario which is up north of Aurelia so I literally phoned her from a hospital bed and said I'm I heard about your brother passing away you know my condolences and she said how are you and I said well here's my story here's what I'm going through because I haven't seen you in a while like you know I just lost a kidney on dialysis I'm waiting uh for another living donor and she said well i'll test for you um once i settled a few things so she tested in december of 2020 in the middle of covid <clears throat> and she blew through the testing by april she phoned me and said i'm your donor so i am matching you on all levels we now have to wait for a date so out of her brother's death, that phone call, in a sense, brought life. And it was, you know, that's how I look at, at these things. And um, so we didn't, I said, you know what, we can't tell anybody what's going on right now, other than your spouse. I told my brother and my sister, because 
we're now moving into a period where uh, we don't know when our transplant date is and COVID was raging and COVID shut down transplants in May of 2020. And I said, <coughs> excuse me. And I said, we just have to be patient. And she sort of understood because she was a big advocate for organ transplant, but she sort of wanted to tell everybody and said, you know, we just got to be patient. So the, the uh, organ donor gets to pick the date. So she got a phone call in June that there was a cancellation. And we, uh, she said, we can do June 23rd. I said, book it. Like, let's do it. Let's get this done. Because we were both really excited. It, this was by no, I was by no means scared. This was my, this was my goal is to get a transplant. So it was like, I've got it. We've got to get this through. So for the next two weeks, we did our last testing. We didn't tell anybody. And then when uh, about a week, four days to a week before, we sort of sprung it on everybody that I'm going to get a transplant next week. And my old friend from kindergarten, who we all grew up with, is my donor. And on June 23rd, 2021, in the middle of COVID, um, I got a beautiful new kidney, as as uh, the transplant surgeon said. He said it was a beautiful kidney. I feel great. Uh, it's 14 months. I'm back working. Uh, I went back working in January. And it's um, it's a new life. And I'm starting to do, other than traveling, I'm starting to do everything back that I, I want to complete and do. So, so the question became, and I'm writing an article on this, is like, how do you thank somebody who essentially saved your life? And that's a really daunting question to answer. So I said, how do I, I her name is Mary. I said, Mary, how do I thank you for this? And she said, just give back. And that was my impetus for getting involved with TAP. I met uh, a, a transplant ambassador who donated her kidney at Sunnybrook. And uh, we chatted for a while. And I now know her. And But we chatted for a while while I was on dialysis. And the first thing I asked her, because she donated to her brother, I said, Are, is your brother traveling? And he said, yes, he's traveling. I said, okay, well, this is good because I, I need to get back to seeing my 71st first country. And um, so that's what I've been doing. I got onboarded, I believe it was in uh, just early in the year around March or April. And um, I think I've talked with about four or five uh, people so far. Some had polycystic, some didn't, but just to reassure them and educate them that what they're experiencing, I have probably experienced. And I can tell them this is what it's like on the other side. And, um, you know, the most common question is, well, how do you, you know, how do you get a donor? And I said, well, it's the tell, it's not the ask. You don't ask, I need a kidney. It's like, here's what I'm going through. And you leave it up to somebody who listens to your story to make the decision. And I was really surprised. A friend of mine in North Bay, I have a lot of friends up in North Bay because of the arts community. And, um, he sent me an email said, I heard you need a kidney. I, I drove from uh, Arnstein, which is south of North Bay by about an hour. I drove up to the hospital, got a blood test. I'm A positive. Call me if you need anything further, because I'll take it to the next step. That was out of the blue. And um, those kind of stories happen. There's a lot of good people out there. And you just don't know when somebody will step up. Like my friend, Mary who, who um, I now talk with even more regularly than I did um, just to see how she's doing. But um, it's been an amazing experience. And um, I hope that inspires people to, to take the next step that tell your story and let people tell your story um, and see where it, it goes from there. So over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you, Sue, for an informative presentation on the uh, the amazing support that TAP provides. And Claudia and Paul, that was some some powerful stuff. Uh, I was nodding my head so much, I'm going to have whiplash tomorrow. Just knowing what what you guys have endured and hearing your story and and hearing it on a daily basis within the PKD community and here at the PKD Foundation of Canada, and that's. It just reiterates how important this partnership between our two organizations is. 
um, because there are so many similarities between people's journeys, whether it be PKD or CKD, um, when transplantation and dialysis and the journey goes in that direction, um, peer-to-peer -peer support is invaluable. And talking to someone, like Claudia said, um, talking to someone that you're not uh, ashamed to ask questions, that you feel comfortable with, um, that you can ask questions that you may not want to ask your doctor, um, these are where patients who have been on that journey and have gone down that road um, can bring so much insight. So thank you, uh, Claudia and Paul, for sharing your journeys with us tonight. Um, I know from the, the questions and uh, the comments uh, how it's already resonated. So we're getting a positive feedback already. Um, I do encourage everyone to uh, ask questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we have just under 15 minutes to handle questions. Um, and address anything uh, that may be on your mind. So I'm going to start um, with a few questions that have already been um, addressed kindly by Sue during the presentation. Uh, let's start, uh, is this across Canada or mainly in Ontario? So Sue speaks to currently TAP is integrated in the renal clinics in Ontario, but the ambassadors, so the folks that we've heard from tonight and the uh, the uh, profiles that are on the TAP website are available to anyone across the country. So uh, in addition to that, the patients seeking donor service, uh, which Sue touched on and getting your profile up there on the website, getting a, um, an email address through TAP as well, is for folks outside of Ontario. So that is a nationwide service that's now provided um, from our friends at TAP. Uh, there is no wait list or uh, limit to the patient seeking donor section. So um, there's no wait. Uh, if you send your information to Sue um, and the fine folks at TAP, they'll get it up and get everything onboarded uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we have a comment here uh, from Carolyn that says, love Claudia's story, so informative and inspiring. Uh, thank you for that, Carolyn. Um, we have uh, a couple questions here that, that I'll defer to Paul and Claudia as well. So for the both of you, you can offer your insight. Um, what advice would you give to someone with PKD related to kidney transplantation, um, both in terms of self-care? So what did you do for yourself? And then any advice that you would have for your younger self prior to transplantation? Claudia, do you want to start? <laughs> Claudia, are you there? Oh, she. I don't think Claudia. Paul, how about you start? Um, okay, and you can get Claudia online. Uh, what would I tell my younger self? Um, I've had, I've brought that up. Um, now we're talking in, you know, the early '90s. Education, I, there's more education today, obviously, than there was back then. Um, it's hard in your 20s because of your, well, because of your lifestyle. I mean, I never really drank a lot or anything. I mean, I, I, I led a pretty, uh, and I do lead a pretty clean life. But I know people who have PKD who are still in party mode. And I'm going like, you got to slow down. I think diet, exercise, drink a lot of water, all the basics, all the good, healthy stuff. And, and if people ask why, tell them why. It's like I'm trying to prolong um, my, your life. I mean, I lasted till I was 57. Let me see, how old was I on Dallas? It's 56. Um, I tried everything to keep myself going. So, uh, so your younger self, just like, yeah, don't do that. Or just diet and exercise is the most important. What was the first part of that question again? Uh, what advice would you give to someone with PKD related to kidney transplant? So anything that you dealt with directly uh, tied to PKD and your well, kidney? Well, I felt, well, I had, a, I had the uh, dialysis team at Sunnybrook and I had doctor, I love bragging about Dr. Ali Zahiri, one of the, uh, my dialysis nephrologists, it was absolutely amazing. Listen to your doctors and ask yourself a lot of questions, ask them a lot of questions. Like, 
when you're on dialysis, why is this happening? What does this number mean? How can I bring that number down from my blood test? A lot of that, uh, when I found out my potassium was getting higher, I was going like, okay, well, what's doing that? Okay, well, I overdid it on milk last week. Let's see what happens. Following week, I'm back to normal. Okay, so here's my limit for milk. <coughs> I was really lucky that I was peeing. Uh, I only had no renal function, maybe the last four months out of that two years. So I was still going strong. And that made a big difference because once I had to control my fluids, I, I was on three, I was drinking three liters of water a day because there was talk through my nephrologist that constantly, um, constantly going to the bathroom to just to flush out your system might help reduce, um, the cyst growth. So I was trying everything. And I even tried, if anybody's out there um, has tried this, I tried the first drug that came out generic, but I, I was too far along with cyst growth and creatinine levels. And I reacted with side effects too much. So, so half the time it's, it's a lot of logical things and, and educating yourself through your dialysis nurse who they know so much. And I had one, one dialysis, um, nurse who said who was used to be a doctor in in Pakistan and we compared a lot of traveling in Pakistan stories and he said oh if you're going to get transplant make sure you do this 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 and this you know if you've got a hernia get it addressed like get this stuff done because you don't want to have as he said operations post transplant although I've had two and because there was just no no way around it but I'm doing fine um so I hope that's not too long an answer but Oh, that's great. Thank you, Paul. Claudia, if you can hear us, okay, can you unmute now and uh, offer your insight? Certainly. I hope you guys can hear me. I'm, it's a little bit choppy on my end. We can hear you. Um, okay. But Perfect. So I would probably follow along the same sentiments as Paul in terms of um, advice that I would give is basically, you know, take care of yourself. Um, you know, try and lead a healthy a lifestyle, you know, um, eat properly, uh, watch your salt intake. Uh, I would, I would definitely say, you know, monitor your blood pressure. That's, that's really key. And, um, try and, you know, if you can uh, exercise and also just watch your weight, try and control your weight, um, as much as possible. Um, in terms of, uh, advice that I would give to my younger self, um, I would say, uh, self-advocation. So, learning to be comfortable enough to ask questions in terms of, you know, what, what exactly is my care? Uh, what are my medications that I'm taking? Why am I taking them? And not be afraid to basically speak up and ask my doctor, why are, why are we doing this and why are we doing this? Because I think a lot of times we just accept what is being told to us, but we're not questioning why. And it's very important that you talk about your treatment and ask those difficult questions. That's what they're there for. Great insight from both of you. And I think it's important to emphasize that you also, you take things on in the, the chunks that you can handle uh, and go at your pace, right? Like Claudia, it's, it's amazing to hear your story from going, from not wanting to share any video to then gradually getting it to your congregation, then sharing it on your forums, um, and now you're shouting it from the rooftops. And I think that's really important to see that, that development because the, the first step is the hardest for a lot of people to take, right? Which was showing your video to those hundred people. Um, so it, it's a testament to taking what you can manage and then building off of that, I think is very important. Uh, we have a, 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 sorry, go ahead, Claudia. Oh, I think she's good. Okay, um, Claudia, if you can hear us, jump back in anytime. Uh, we have a comment from Marg, um, that's a great point to make. She says, my sons were in their early twenties when I was diagnosed with PKD. Uh, the three of us got involved in clinical trials for PKD management and research. You learn a lot about PKD participating in these clinical trials. Uh, please pass this information on to others. So as Paul uh, spoke to uh, different ways to learn more about the disease, really asking those questions, coming prepared to your meetings, 
uh, the clinical trial option is another alternative to get yourself into the uh, the PKD ring and to to make a difference. Clinical trials are uh, an invaluable resource for for so many. Um, so that's a fantastic way to get involved. Thanks, Mark. Um, there is uh, let's see here. Uh, a question for Claudia and Paul again. Uh, did having a genetic history of PKD affect your mindset about transplantation? Paul, how about we start with you? Um, no, it didn't. I, uh, as I said, my goal was not to go the same route as my mother. So it was, it was transplant or that's it. Um, because it would have meant for me, it would have meant the I'd have to seriously readjust my lifestyle uh, because the globe is my oyster. So um, it just it just made it just made me know that I've I've got to work harder to get to get to get to the finish line. Um, it it's sort of that simple for me. It di it didn't affect me at all. I just didn't want to go the route. Right. So. So you I thought, had, I, had that, I had that goal in mind, and it was by hook or crook on getting there. Very important, and uh, and the drive drive is. And, uh, and and can I and to add to that? So you lose your first donor for medical reason. Everybody knew somebody was testing. Then you got to go tell everybody, and then you got to explain why. So after her, I said, I'm not talking about who my donors are. You're just going to hear yes or no. So, because that was the mental strain on me at that point, when I heard I lost my donor, I was at work, I literally got a phone call uh, and it was a very rushed phone call. It says, hi, we're just letting you know your donor didn't pass, blah, blah. And I went, what? It was like when my father died. It was like, what? What do you mean? You know, and, and I left work and I was gone for days. So uh, it was a real serious reaction mentally. And, and then I had to pick myself up. My best friend was my next donor, even though she got rejected. I had this community around to say, you know, we'll get you there. So that alone was uh, enough to keep you going. So anyway. Well, I, if I can just jump in, I will say my response was quite different than Paul's from the standpoint that um, nobody in my family had ever had a transplant. Um, as I said earlier, everybody in my family who had PKD had passed away at a relatively early age. So my mindset was sort of, of um, unfortunately, you know, it's either, this is probably it for me. So if my, since my mom wasn't going to be uh, a potential donor, it's like, okay, I either learn to accept my fate and I'm probably going to pass away at an early age like my father did. Um, so unfortunately, it was in a, a very negative place. I really, truly didn't even believe that I would live past 47 at that stage. Okay, thank you very much, both of you, for answering that. Um, I know we're getting close to uh, 8 o'clock, so we'll, we'll begin to slowly wrap things up. But, um, it's important to, uh, to make sure that all of our questions are answered. There's a really great comment here. Um, I just want to read for some, for some feedback to those speakers this evening. Uh, it comes from uh, JP. Uh, I'm going to be a donor hopefully within the next two months. Uh, it's for my brother-in-law. He was born with one kidney, which failed about 25 to 30 years ago. He is now 75, and his donor was to be his father, who today is now 105 years old. Uh, I never hesitated to offer up my kidney, knowing how well and long his father has lived with one kidney. As much as I am absolutely thrilled to be his donor, I'm still anxious. The Zoom call is calming my nerves. Thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, I'd love to hear from the donors as well. So that's from Gay. Uh, Gay, I know Sue has already responded to you and, uh, and passed along her contact information. Um, to hear from donor perspectives. Um, of course, there are those many profiles on the TAP website uh, that you can uh, scroll through based on the legend. You can find their criterium that matches your, uh, your needs or your desires to talk, and then they'll pair you up in that respect. But the, the part that really stuck out to me is the Zoom call is calming my nerves. Um, it's a testament to how important it is to hear from other folks that have gone on a similar journey 
who may be a little further ahead than you um, or that have, have been dealt a different hand so that you understand the spectrum of polycystic kidney disease because it is very different as we all know for each patient. Uh, in my family, my grandmother lived to be 98 years old um, and never required a kidney transplant or dialysis. Uh, my mom inherited it from her and had two liver transplants um, and will need a kidney transplant. Um, and like Claudia and Paul described, she too had that swollen abdomen. Um, and she, like Claudia, looked nine months pregnant for 15 years of my life. So it's, it's very important that you hear from other folks and that you connect with other folks, be it through social media, the foundation's website, uh, TAP as well. Um, this is really just the beginning of a partnership. So if there is any way that either one of our organizations can help, um, the conversation is only starting tonight. Um, be sure to reach out to Sue at TAP myself at the PKD Foundation of Canada. Uh, Paul and Claudia's information uh, and contact info has been provided as well if you wish to connect with them. So uh, before we wrap things up, Sue, would you like to take any uh, any minutes just to close things out from TAP side? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, it's been it's been wonderful to uh, to uh, do this uh, together with you and uh, for the great showing that come out tonight. Um, I'm always in awe when I hear um, stories from our transplant ambassadors and, uh, you know, you can just imagine uh, how even how much better a telephone conversation is <laughs> when you can relax on your couch uh, and, and have a chat. So um, that's what TAP's all about. And, um, and uh, you know, we're here to we're here to, to share our stories about transplant, but also about, as you heard tonight, uh, about dialysis and about, uh, you know, the road to transplant and whether you're going to need one and how you deal with it. And I know that earlier when Paul and uh, Claudia and I were talking, Claudia mentioned that, um, uh, you know, one of the things that she, you know, might tell her younger self, but she did mention today is, you know, start letting people know early that you might need a kidney transplant, having those conversations early um, so that you're not in a, you know, in a crisis position. Um, when you do find that you need one. Maybe you never will, but isn't it great to have some of those conversations early um, and, uh, and, and kind of get a sense of, of who's, who understands your situation and who might be there when you need it. Anyway, it was just, uh, it was a pleasure. Um, we're excited to, um, to share our services and extend our services um, to the PKD community and feel free to, to reach out at any point. Awesome. Well, uh, before I wrap things up with a couple foundation uh, housekeeping items, I must take the opportunity, Sue, Paul, Claudia, Mary, who joined us uh, earlier. Thank you all so much for sharing your, your time, your stories, um, so impactful. Um, I think the, this is going to be an amazing partnership. Um, I really love what you guys have done now with uh, the patient seeking donors profiles. Um, we know the importance of that and I put it in the chat um, a link that we have on our website about finding your living donor. Um, so many different avenues are out there now to share your story. It's better now than it's ever been um, to get out there on social media, um, public media, um, email campaigns. The, the opportunities are limitless and both of our organizations are here to help you craft uh, your campaign. So thank you all again for joining us. Uh, Tap, you've been amazing tonight. Um, a couple things just to close out um, and then we'll wrap for this evening uh, is uh, some exciting uh, activities that are coming up within the PKD Foundation of Canada. So September 4th, which is this Sunday, uh, is once again PKD Awareness Day in Canada, recognized by Health Canada. Um, and grac gracious, graciously, I should say, um, proclaimed on a local level by over 40 towns and cities across Canada. So. Follow us on social media. We'll be sharing uh, updates on lighting monuments, CN Tower, Niagara Falls, BC Place. All of Canada will be lit up teal on September 4th for PKD Awareness Day. And we encourage you to join in the conversation um, on social media, share our posts, get the word out there, talk to your family and friends about PKD on this day and every day for that matter. Um, and of course, we've been sending out communications if you're already on our email list. Um, which you can join by visiting npkd.ca. September is our big walk to end PKD season. So 
So we have a variety of walks taking place across Canada, as well as the virtual walk to end PKD. So if you are interested in joining this campaign, raising funds for critical Canadian research um, and advocating for PKD, visit npkd.ca slash walk, um, sign up and join us for either one of our in-person events or if the virtual route is preferred, you have that option as well. So over September on our social channels and our email communications, a lot of information will be coming out that we're happy to share with you. And we look forward to you being a part of it. So I'll wrap things up now a little after eight o'clock. Thank you all for joining us this evening. We had a great group. Thank you to those that asked questions. Um, and as I've uh, emphasized a few times tonight, do not hesitate to reach out to any of us on this webinar tonight. Um, if there's anything that we can do to help you. So I wish you all a great evening and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.